Welcome, Nicole and Andrea. Thank you. Welcome today to our conversation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nicole Miller, the Regional Parent Mentor for the Northwest Region of Machine Alliance for Families. I am the parent of a son with a developmental disability and feel passionate about inclusion in all aspects of life, from community to school and everything in between. Joining us today is my coworker, Andrea. Andrea, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, as uh, Nicole stated, my name is Andrea Beechnaw and I am the Central Regional Parent Mentor for Michigan. Um, I came into this work of helping families because I have a now 11 year old daughter who was born with Down syndrome. I know how hard families have to advocate for their children to be accepted and included. And you know, as a white cis female who grew up in middle class, there weren't a lot of things I had to fight for. There weren't a lot of things I was excluded from. It was my daughter who really opened my eyes to this need for diversity, equity, inclusion. And that's why today I'm joining Nicole to talk to you about this difficult topic. Um, as we move into today's discussion, I wanna let you all know again, there is a questions tab available to you as we will be going over a lot of information um, so if you have any questions that you want answered, we will give some time throughout the presentation to try to cover those. And our tech support, Stephanie, will be monitoring that um, and letting us know if there are questions. But in the meantime, we're gonna get started right away and Nicole's gonna go over today's agenda with us. Yes, so let's talk about today's agenda. Our topic today, diversity, equity, inclusion, and ableism, our hope is to provide you with an understanding of what ableism is and the impact it has on people living with disabilities. We will also help you understand ableism in education and recognize what ableism looks like in school for your child and talk about how the Individuals with Disability and Education Act is supposed to break down ableism in education and bring about a more inclusive learning environment. Finally, we wanna talk about ways that you can become that great advocate for change, not just for your child, but for all people impacted by ableism. And don't forget, please type your questions into the questions tab or feature. Andrea, would you take us to the definition of ableism? Sure, Nicole. So ableism is defined as the discrimination of and social prejudice against people with disabilities based on the belief that able bodies are superior. So at the root of ableism is that belief that people with disabilities, whether a person has a physical disability, a mental health condition, or an intellectual disability, needs to be fixed in some way. And it really defines them by the person, by that specific disability, rather than by their unique self. Um, ableism is one of the most overlooked isms when it comes to social justice, equity, and inclusion, despite people with disabilities being the largest minority group. In the United States, the CDC estimates one in four adults has some form of disability. Um, so when we're looking at ableism, this is a big, big area that needs some advocacy advocacy from all of us. Before we can truly begin to understand how to advocate though, to end ableism, we really are gonna start to let you guys see and dive deeper into what it means to first and foremost have a disability, how that is defined and what ableism looks like. So first we're gonna move into two models that are typically used when we're defining and understanding disability. Yeah, so first let's talk about the medical model of disability. In this model, the disability located within the individual is seen as the impairment or deficit. It's seen as something that's wrong with them. So this leads to the belief that the person is helpless or suffering, and it makes it seem like they need to be fixed or cured with drugs, surgeries, shock treatments, or other therapies. It also defines everything in the term of an able-bodied norm, and that allows for that person with a disability to no longer be seen as equal. This often leads to people with disabilities being socially excluded, undervalued, and treated as, as if they are mere objects to be pitied. This can lead to the conclusion that, pre prevent, that to prevent disability in our society, strategies like forced sterilization, contraception, and eugenics can be applied without consideration of that individual. Andrea, can you take us to another model that took hold more recently? Yeah, so Nicole talked about the medical model. The social model was created by activists and it's a lot 
newer. It was created in the 70s and 80s, um, and it views the origin of disability as the attitudes and physical structures of society rather than those medical conditions faced by the individual. And it separates out impairments that are the physical and intellectual limitations on an individual from disability, which is defined as the disadvantages imposed on an individual due to the failures of society to design a world that supports people with impairments. Um, problems with the social model, despite it pushing for strong action and changing societal views and the barriers caused by them, which is very critical and important, it often loses sight of the real impact that an individual's impairments can have just on their daily living. And it can be more effective for change of those with what we call physical, visible impairments, such as people who use wheelchairs and individuals with visual impairments, but much more often those with the invisible illnesses, as we call them, such as a diagnosis of ADHD and intellectual disability or other mental health condition are often left by the wayside as we advocate. Um, so when we're talking about disability and defining it, a better way to look at disability may lay, lie in a combination of both the medical model and the social model where we all recognize and accept that there are going to be people in the world who will live their entire life impacted by their impairments, but that they will still be able to equally contribute to their communities through acceptance and necessary accommodation. Um, we've defined ableism a little bit. We've talked about the two ways we look at disability. Um, I want to see if there are any questions before we go further, because we're going to dive now way into ableism, into types and forms. Um, so if there are questions, Stephanie. Andrea, thank you for checking. I do not see any questions currently, yeah. but I do want to remind everyone they can use their GoToWebinar um, control bar to go ahead and open that questions tab and type those questions in, and we'll address them as we can. Okay, so thank you, Stephanie. Nicole's going to take us into types of ableism now. Yep, so let's talk about the types and forms of ableism. Uh, institutional ableism is discrimination that exists at an institutional level. It is often unacknowledged because it has been normalized by the larger society. This can include institutions or systems described as medical, educational, legislative, public transportation, or employment. Next is interpersonal level ableism. This is discrimination that is experienced by an individual in their day-to-day -day life when having social interactions with strangers or peers, or in the way that they are treated by those who are close to them. One example of this might be the parent who is constantly seeking a cure for their child, or a store owner who refuses a person entry into their store because that individual is visually impaired and has a guide dog. This can affect day-to-day -day interactions and personal relationships. We also have internal level ableism. We can all be affected by things that we are told over and over again about ourselves. Many people with disabilities who have been bombarded with messages that they aren't normal, not equal, or not worthy may begin to believe those things about themselves. Whether consciously or unconsciously done, messages about worth and belonging can affect an individual. They may begin to believe that some, of, that some of their accommodations are a privilege and not a right, and that they are better off in a segregated setting or classroom, or that they shouldn't allow, be allowed to become a parent. Andrea, would you take us along to some forms of ableism next? Sure, Nicole. So the types of ableism talk about the relationships between an individual with a disability and the systems that are supposed to support them with other individuals who do not have disabilities and when looking inwards on themselves. Forms of ableism are how ableism presents itself in society. And again, there are three key types. When we're talking about hostile ableism, you know, that's something that I think we can all envision as unfriendly, antagonistic, and sometimes aggressive. Um, examples of that can be the blatant disregard for the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is supposed to provide for society making a more inclusive world, but often businesses don't create accessible spaces, they don't create accessible services, and they don't create ex accessible products. 
that disregard is hostile ableism at its work. Um, it's the bullying of a student who has an intellectual disability or a speech impairment in school simply because they cannot keep up academically or communicate clearly. Uh, mocking a person who has a physical mannerisms related to their disability by copying them and degrading some, them in a way. Um, the heightened risk of sexual assault that occurs, over 80% of females with disabilities and a large portion of males with disabilities, especially the intellectual disabilities, um, it's the prevalence of that, and then they are re-victimized by society, by society blaming them for asking for it. There's a case in a Texas high school right now where a girl walked down the hallway and was holding hands, therefore consenting. Um, school staff and law enforcement often don't believe those persons with intellectual disabilities when they say something happened. And then prosecutors are known for not prosecuting simply because they don't feel a jury would believe that any person without a disability would do something to someone who has a disability. So these are all forms of hostile ableism. When we're talking about benevolent ableism, that's a bit more difficult to recognize as ableism because the definition of benevolent is having a disposition to do good, well-meaning, expressing goodwill and kindness. Benevolent ableism arises from our views, and we're thinking back to that medical model of disability that Nicole mentioned earlier, that people with disabilities are weak, that they are vulnerable and in need of saving, in need of being fixed, and that they cannot be independent and must rely on us, the able-bodied. Um, examples of benevolent ableism are pushing a person who uses a wheelchair without asking if it's needed or wanted. Uh, making important decisions for an individual with a disability without asking for their input or preference. A stranger offering to pray for someone who has visible disability or over celebrating a person with a disability who's completed a basic task that they do every day. And we call that inspiration porn. Those are examples of benevolent ableism. Um, and then we've got ambivalent ableism. It's a mixture of both. What could start out as benevolent ableism in which with well-meaning on your part, you are pushing a person who uses a wheelchair over a bump in the sidewalk because you feel like they may not be able to conquer that task, but you neither ask if they want or need assistance. That can turn quickly into hostile ableism as the person who uses the wheelchair gets angry for the unneeded assistance. They ask you to stop, they get frustrated you start yelling at them, they start yelling at you, shouting back and forth, calling names, and the situation could de-escalate further into violence. And that is what ambivalent ableism is. Um, again, these are how it's presented in society. And now Nicole's gonna dive a little deeper into what more examples of what ableism can look like, because we cannot begin to discuss advocating for change until we are able to recognize when ableism is occurring. Thanks, Andrea. So we've talked about types and forms of ableism, but ableism itself can include many different things. There are several factors that can influence ableism towards a particular individual with a disability. This could be visible versus invisible impairment, physical versus intellectual disability, whether or not a condition is well known to society, or whether or not a condition has a history of being stigmatized. This can lead to stereotypes, myths, and slurs. There are so many ways that ableism can be experienced. People with disabilities are often mocked or made fun of as the punchline of jokes. The media often represents people with disabilities in a tragic or inspirational way, rather than framing that individual um, in all the multitudes as part of the human experience, as a whole human. Words have power, and so often the vocabulary that you choose can have a detrimental effect on a person with a disability, whether you intend that or not. Harmful words like lame, retarded, and dumb have been used to describe specific disabilities and are now often used interchangeably with words like stupid and bad. We also tend to misuse real diagnoses, such as the phrase, I'm so OCD or today I feel so ADHD. Recently, the pop singer Lizzo, she used the word spaz in one of her songs and a person who was diagnosed with a form of cerebral palsy called spastic diplegia called her on it. Lizzo's response was immediate and the song lyric was changed within days. 
Another example is inaccessible design. We see this in things like buildings, playgrounds, public spaces without ramps for wheelchairs, or sidewalks that may be filled with obstacles. We often see crosswalks that don't make noise to allow visually impaired individuals to know when to cross, or we see signs without braille um, in elevators or on menus. Another example is technology. Another example could include technology. There are websites that don't have um, text enlargement options or online assessments perhaps for students that don't offer text to speech. We often see products that only cater to able-bodied individuals instead of being more inclusive. Educational di discrimination examples include segregated classrooms, a refusal to provide accommodations or that needed assist assistive technology, or we might see a teacher assuming a student with an invisible disability such as dyslexia or ADHD is just not trying hard enough instead of seeking out those needed accommodations. Employment discrimination examples include severely underpaying individuals with a disability. There are still many sheltered workshops in existence. A belief perhaps that an individual with a disability will be less productive as a worker, so that employer chooses not to hire them. Or a general refusal to provide uh, necessary accommodations to allow that individual to be successful. Or allowing a workplace bully with no, allowing a workplace bullying situation without any repercussions to the bully. Or allowing sick leave for a physical illness, but not for a mental health illness. Finally, we have barriers to care, and that could include medical professionals that ignore the lived experience of their patients, possibly incorrectly blaming them when new symptoms arise, blaming that person's disability and not taking into account how that individual is feeling or potentially withdrawing medical care, believing that nothing could possibly help them. We have examples of people prioritizing the health and independence of people without disabilities at the expense of those with disabilities. The COVID-19 pandemic was a clear example of this with the refusal to wear masks. This made some people with disabilities much more vulnerable and it did include prolonged time indoors in close proximity of others while attempting to access care or needed services. And we still have physical restraints that happen today in schools, hospitals, and institutions, resulting in harm and even death of individuals with disabilities. Please make sure you're using your questions feature if you have anything that you would like to contribute or ask about. Andrea, would you take us on to some comic strips that show additional examples of ableism? Sure, Nicole. Um, we wanted to provide you with some visuals and there was a set of comics that are fantastic to kind of emphasize what we're talking about. Um, so Nicole and I are going to read through three comics and I want you to try to imagine if you can how you would feel if you were the person with the disability in each of these. And in this first comic strip, it's illustrating how a stereotype associated with a disability, in this case a person with a visual impairment, can impact the person with a disability. So in the first panel, we have a visually impaired young man and a, and a woman who um, is following the stereotype. And she says, oh, you're blind. Would you like to touch my face? Or, no, no, thank you, says the young man. And in panel two, no, really, touch my face. It's OK. And the young man says, that's a myth. Real blind people don't go around touching strangers' faces. And then the third panel, the ladies starting, we talked about hostile, touch my face. No, let go, says the young man. And finally, in the fourth panel, the young man is home and the father is asking, hi, honey, how was your day? I need to wash my hands, says the young man. OK, so would you want a stranger forcing you to touch their face, whether you're visually impaired or not? No, there are, there are so many stereotypes out there surrounding people with disabilities. This is just a broad example, but you can see how just assumptions can change the path of a person, how it can impact that person. We're gonna go through a couple more comics and just illustrate this. And again, use your questions if you have questions so we can answer them. But Nicole's gonna take us through another one. 
Sure, in our next example, we have invisible illness and medical care. So this is a great comic that shows how a person who has what we consider an invisual impairment, such as ADHD, ODD, chronic pain, the, the difficulties they can face when trying to conquer medical professionals that don't necessarily see from their perspective what that disability is like. In the first panel, we have a doctor that says to a patient, some people use narcotics to get high. So when you come here and you say you're in constant pain, that tells me you're a lying drug seeker. In the second panel, our doctor says, if you ask for pain meds, you're a drug seeker. If you seem desperate, you're a drug seeker. If you cry, you're a drug seeker. In our third panel, it shows our doctor saying, if you talk back to me, you're a drug seeker. If you don't like me assuming you're a drug seeker, you're a drug seeker. And in our last panel, our, pa our patient asks, could I talk to a doctor who isn't horrible? With our doctor replying, doctor shopping, classic drug seeker. A lot of assumptions and stereotypes taking place there. Andrea, would you take us to our next example? Sure, Nicole. So, and we, I mentioned inspiration porn briefly when I was talking about benevolent ableism. And so this comic illustrates that it's a situation in which we over celebrate a person who is doing a normal human thing, such as the boy with Down syndrome, who is excluded from playing basketball all season, except for being allowed to take a shot with 10 seconds left in the final game of the season with his team up by 20 points, simply because it makes able-bodied people feel good about inclusion. So when we're looking at this, I'm gonna read the first panel, okay? There's, there, it looks like they're all teenagers. There's a young girl out walking her dog and there's two other girls and they say, excuse me, I just wanted to say, it's so inspiring seeing you walking your dog despite your disability. And the young woman says, please don't. When strangers say I'm inspiring, they mean they're amazed I can do normal human things. Like I'm a video of a cat walking on its hind legs. I don't want to be your inspiration, okay? I just wanna walk my dog, have a good day. And in the final panel, you see that she's been completely ignored of her wishes. And the two women are like, the way she chewed us out, so inspiring. I can't wait to post this on Facebook. So we all want to celebrate things that are inspirational in our lives, those big moments that we all experience or successes at overcoming some great challenges that we've been working towards. But we got to be careful in over celebrating something that is a normal daily part of the human experience that we would not normally celebrate simply because a person has a disability. Um, we're going to stop again and check with our tech person, Stephanie. Are there any questions in the question bar? We do have a couple of questions. One I'm gonna hold on to for a little bit because I think you're already gonna address it. Um, we do have someone asking if there is a way to find out if their schools are using the medical or social model when they're writing IEP goals or what questions they may ask to find out if staff is being trained on these ideas. Yeah. I. I think we're going to dive deeper into what school looks like, ableism looks like in schools. Um, when you're defining disability, it's about, it's when you're looking at your child's IEP, are they looking at the whole picture of your child or are they primarily focusing on, well, if they have ADHD, we need to address this, this, and this, and not really looking at who your child is. I guess that would be how I'm distinguishing if they're looking at full picture, if they're looking at how the school barriers are impacting and not just how, again, the disability is to get that broad spectrum. Um, Nicole, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I would disagree. I, I would agree with that. It would be trying to look at the child as a whole and see what their needs are. And we will have a great handout with some additional information that one can tap into, along with, of course, finding your regional parent mentor and getting some assistance um, digesting that sometimes meaty document, that IEP document, just to make sure that what you see um, is represented within that document and it looks more holistic, right? Because we don't want it to look like just a small fracture of our child. We wanna make sure that their whole being is represented. Yep. If, 
if that's all the questions, is that all Stephanie for now? We're going to keep going. That's all for now. Thank you, ladies. Okay. Hopefully now you have a clearer picture of what ableism is and what it looks like. We're now going to really dive into, Nicole's going to start the conversation of why should we care? What What is the all-encompassing, you know, impacts that ableism can have? Yeah, so let's take a look. Why should we care about ableism? Ableism has an impact on access and quality in many ways, in many areas. Within education, we even we see that even though a federal law is in place to promote inclusion for students with disabilities, many are still placed in segregated classrooms or center-based programs. Often, if they are in a general education classroom, they are isolated as an island in the mainstream, meaning that they may be present in that classroom, but not fully supported to access their education. In employment, we see the U.S. Department of Labor for 2021. It lists the employment rate of people with disabilities at 19.1% compared to 63.7% for people without disabilities. That's a huge gap. In housing, there's just such limited options for people with disabilities. There simply is not enough accessible or affordable housing options. There are community activities that don't take into account the need for accessibility. Things like a recreational sports program that doesn't include someone with a disability, playgrounds built without accessible designs, or even book clubs that don't offer braille options. Those limit access to community activities that folks with disabilities would like to join into as well. In transportation, there are many barriers to just getting around in the community for people with disabilities. There are inaccessible vehicles in both the public and private sector, and this might lead to a person having limited accessible transportation options that results in spending extra time, potentially hours, in a shared transportation vehicle and missing appointments. Within medical, within medical care, there is a lack of qualified health professionals who understand how to support all of the unique needs of a person with a disability. There is an additional burden of added costs for medical equipment, treatment, and prescription. Along with the transportation barrier, individuals with disability face significant challenges to just accessing everyday medical care. Andrea, would you start us with the impacts of ableism next? Sure, so Nicole talked about lower access and quality. People with disabilities are also at greater risk for all sorts of awful things as listed on this PowerPoint slide, just as an impact of living in an ableist society. You know, Nicole talked about employment. I can talk about unemployment. Um, people with disabilities have almost twice the likelihood of unemployment at 10.1% versus 5.2% with people without disabilities. And that's just for those people with disabilities who are actively looking for a job. Eight in 10 people with disabilities are not in the labor force, whether it's due to lack of access and support, lack of accommodation, lack of people assuming competence, all of many and many reasons um, compared to three in 10 for people without disabilities. And that unemployment risk can lead to poverty, okay? Lack of support and accommodation to work at a competitive job, um, the need to stay under a certain amount of pay in order to receive necessary benefits to get, say, direct care support and things that people with disabilities need. Um, the higher cost of living that Nicole mentioned for people with disabilities, simply because they mean, need ex extra accommodations they may need extra medications, extra doctor's appointments, all of that. So that pushes a large number of our population of people with disabilities into poverty. Um, institutionalization, I mean, that still happens in states. Many advocate groups have pushed to eliminate the institutionalization of people with disabilities. Um, if you want to see Geraldo Rivera, pre-tabloid talk show host, um, look into Willowbrook State School. Um, it was an institution for children with intellectual disabilities, I believe it was in the 70s. It's a very heartbreaking story of what life was like and how poorly treated these children were simply because they were not, not considered fit for society and put in an institution. Um, people with disabilities are at greater risk for loneliness, depression, and chronic stress. 
We live in a society that is not inclusive and often people with disabilities are segregated. Nicole talked about limited access to community, book clubs, sports. Those are ways that we all connect to other human beings and form reciprocal relationships. Those are often denied or not accessible to people with disabilities. Um, all of that meaningful competitive employment, all of it, and medical care, that creates creates that sense of loneliness and hopelessness, isolation for people with disabilities. And if you put all of those together, early death, poverty, lack of housing, unemployment, healthcare, education, it's no wonder that many people with disabilities have a significantly lower life expectancy. These are all impacts of all people with disabilities and that's why ableism and advocating for change matters. Um, there, we're gonna talk a little history with you now and talk a little worst case scenario as Nicole moves into our last real discussion on the impacts, but that is the push to eliminate disability altogether. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. One of the most difficult impacts of ableism is the attempt to eliminate disability altogether. Historical examples include forced sterilization, and we see that in Nazi Germany, 1933, there was passage of the law for the prevention of hereditary diseased offspring. This allowed for forced sterilization of anyone who was deemed genetically unsound by a hereditary health court. Here in the United States in 1927, we have a Supreme Court decision, Buck versus Bell, written by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., where the court ruled that forced sterilization did not violate the due process rights of an individual with a disability. And in the United States present day, there are still 31 states who have forced sterilization laws in place on the books for people with disabilities. Eugenics is the practice or advocacy of controlled selective breeding of human populations to improve the population's genetic composition, oftentimes through forced sterilization. An example of this in the United States today is Peter Singer, he is a professor of bioethics at Princeton University and a strong advocate for eugenics by killing infants with disabilities and allowing euthanasia for children and adults with disabilities. We also have mass genocides in our history. An example would be where in Nazi Germany, the first individuals put into the gas chamber were those with mental and physical disabilities. And in more recent times, in 2016, there were 19 people with disabilities killed and 25 wounded at a disability center in Japan due to what was deemed disability hate. We at Michigan Alliance for Families are a group that support families of children receiving special education services. So we're now gonna focus on that impact, the reduced access to and lower quality of education and as we're doing that, if you have any questions or have any comments that you would like to use your question feature for, please feel free to join in the conversation. Any questions, Stephanie, before we transition into school? I think go ahead and move into school and some of these questions will um, see if they're not answered at the end. Yeah, so we're, we're gonna really focus, as Nicole stated, we are the organization that supports family of children with disabilities. Um, and so we really wanna focus on how ableism presents itself in education um, as it does everywhere else in society. And hopefully that can answer some more of the, how do you know if you have that balanced IEP where the whole child is being looked at. Um, so when we're looking at how ableism can present itself in school, this, this slide, this is not all encompassing. Um, there are so many other things that can happen, but we wanna show you some of the things. Um, when we're talking, everyone has strengths and limitations. When you're talking about building out for a whole child, you wanna look at strengths as well as limitations. If you ask me to go ice skating, I can tell you that I would probably land on my backside more than being upright because that is not a strength for me. And yet schools are always focusing on what the student can't do when it comes to students with disabilities. How many of you have been in an IEP meeting that completely drags your whole day down? Because all they talk about is what your child cannot do. Okay, that's where I think you start looking at they're focusing on that medical model and fixing the can'ts, okay? IEP should be a complete snapshot of the child 
including strengths, including what helps them learn so that they can build that child up. Um, children with disabilities are still children and they want to learn, they want to follow the rules, they wanna socialize and make friends. Yet they are often seen as behavioral problems who refuse to do something rather than it being recognized that many of these children needs tasks broken down into multiple steps and frequent reminders to eventually be able to do something. This is that assumption of won't rather than can't that we see far too often. Um, how many of you have been told that an IEP goal is too lofty, that the, your child will never be able to fill in that blank? Um, if we continually set the bar low for children with disabilities, then even reaching that bar will set them far back from their peers who do not have disabilities. That is the lower access, lower quality. Yet we continue to separate our children with disabilities into segregated classrooms with lower quality education because it's safer, because it's better design for them, presuming that they will not be able to learn alongside their peers in a classroom with quality education, presuming that they are not competent. Um, this ties into the practice of predetermination of placement that often comes for some children who are found eligible in Michigan under a specific category such as cognitive impairment, such as autism spectrum disorder or emotional impairment that automatically removes children from their peers who do not have disabilities simply because of what they're eligible for and again gives them lower access and quality of education without regarding that individual's strengths and the importance of being included and how that can build up all people with empathy and with learning. Um, we talk about accommodations can make all the difference in leveling the play, playing field for children with disabilities to be able to access that same quality education as their peers without disabilities. Yet so often schools refuse to provide these accommodations due to thinking them unfair to students who don't have disabilities rather than seeing it as building them up so they can meet their peers. Um, an example is providing additional time for processing and response. A lot of children with disabilities are removed from the classroom or passed over or made a fun of for not being able to either respond appropriately in the moment when given a demand or rule to follow or when being asked to respond to an academic question. Okay, accessibility to the general education classroom and curriculum should be built in and not just tacked on as a school sees fit and fair. Um, the way that staff communicate with and about children with disabilities is a clear indication of how strong ableism is in the educational environment. Often children who have more childlike characteristics due to their physical or intellectual disability are spoken to as if they are years younger than they actually are. Um, I've seen teenage boys being taught to improve their behavior via smiley face sticker charts. What teenage boy wants to put a smiley face on a sticker chart to behave better? Okay, this is talking down to some of these students. Staff also have a tendency to talk about a child with a disability right in front of them and make decisions for them without their input or preference. Not allowing a person with a disability to choice and say in their life is a common occurrence and ableistic education and society. Um, there's so many other forms of ableism that can, it can look like in schools. Um, we're not gonna list them all and rattle them off, but we want you to start thinking about the experiences you have had and the experiences your child has had as we now move into laws that are supposed to protect them from these ableist views and allow them to fully participate in the general education classroom with their peers with appropriate supports. So Nicole, are you gonna take us into the laws? Yes, thank you, Andrea. So up until the 1970s, most children with disabilities were not allowed to attend a public school. It was a huge grassroots effort by parents from the 1930s through the 60s that pushed for the passage of laws that allowed our children with disabilities to be educated. The two big federal laws that support children with disabilities today are the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, specifically Section 504, um, which for those of you familiar with the 504 plan is about providing access through accommodation. And the second law is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which pushes to counteract ableism in education in many ways. So let's take a closer look at the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or the IDEA, 
with Andrea. Thanks, Nicole. And I'm not going to read this. This is the section, if you want to dive into the IDEA, this is the section where you can find out more about the inclusive environment. Um, the premise of this is that first and foremost, children with disabilities should be educated alongside their peers without disabilities with appropriate supports and services. Um, when we're talking diversity, equity, and inclusion, I really want to define those terms. Diversity acknowledges all the ways in which people are different. Equity that ensures the fair treatment, access, equality of opportunity and advancement for everyone while also attempting to identify and remove barriers that have prevented some groups from participating. Um, and then inclusion, the act of welcoming, supporting, respecting and valuing all individuals and all groups. Diversity, equity and inclusion or DEI has been quite a polarizing topic these days, um, especially in education. You know, we talked about how ableism is the least talked about of the isms and often children with disabilities and their families are left out of or forgotten in parts of these DEI groups when they work to make change in schools. Um, children with disabilities are segregated often. They're disciplined through seclusion and restraint that has detrimental impacts on them. And they're often pushed to receiving lower quality of education with limited resources to have a successful future outcome after school is done. Yet the IDEA was written to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion for children with disabilities. It was done after numerous studies showed that this was the best model for all students. It was meant to ensure that our children had access to public schools and the general education curriculum and the least restrictive environment, which means to be in classrooms alongside peers who don't have disabilities. Uh, the IDEA advocates for individualization based on strengths and different abilities. And it also advocates that children with disabilities should be seen as equal and have equitable access to learning through supports, thus eliminating that need to segregate. So when we're talking diversity, equity, and inclusion, that is the exact opposite of ableism in our educational setting, okay? There's, the IDEA sets out to support all all persons in an educational setting and a curriculum for all okay we've had laws that say separate is not equal um it applies to children with disabilities there should be no assumptions on competency the idea supports the belief that accommodations can make all the difference it complements the americans with disabilities act that supports through adulthood and it shows that accessibility honors all difference. When we have an accessible environment, an accessible classroom, difference is welcomed um, and children have success. But even with the IDA, a federal law in place that tells society that diversity, equity, and inclusion is the path, we just showed you six or seven examples of how ableism is still prevalent in schools. And uh, collectively, I think we could all go on and on and add to that list. Um, ableism is a big topic. It's a difficult topic. Nicole and I are giving you a broad overview so that you can hopefully see how it impacts not only your child, but so many people that live with disabilities and have those impacts. Um, we're going to shift gears here now and move into advocacy. But before we do, we're going to check in again to see if you have any questions before we can give you some real tools to help swing the pendulum in the direction of that more inclusive society. So Stephanie, are there any questions? A lot of the questions that we have kind of fall into this category of uh, how diversity, equity, and inclusion have recently been politicized. And if you have resources for educating friends and family about the things that they've heard or how to combat um, grassroots actions, trying to eliminate um, and work against diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, that we definitely have some themes around um, how do we share this information with people? What do we do to combat some of this political swing? I mean, you have to be active. I can tell you I have, there are six candidates running for my local school board this fall. And th we have a DEI committee and they're looking, three of them are looking to get rid of it. So I've had personal conversations with all of them. Um, it starts with you, it starts with being in passion and finding groups and connecting to parents in your area and just building from there. I think the most powerful voice is a collective in the community. Um, in terms of bigger picture, you 
I know Nicole and I have been overwhelmed by how awful just from hearing from our jobs, start small, start where you can make changes. Um, but be aware and find those people that don't have that because a lot of people that are taking away from that don't live the experience that we are living. Um, and there is a lot of misinformation out there. Encourage the people that are concerned to volunteer in schools. All our schools need supports so they can see that a lot of the things being pushed in schools aren't really happening. Um, that type of thing. Nicole, do you have other advocate? I know we're going to dive into advocacy a little bit more, but um, any other thoughts on that? That was going to be a that was going to be a great segue to the next great. slide. I can't yeah. appreciate you enough for that because our next slide, if you want to take us there, Stephanie, is advocating for change. And we want to be able to give you some real tools to advocate for change. All of those things that Andrea is saying, relationship building, spreading the word. Well, all of that starts with what you can do to make things happen. It starts with educating yourself on disability. It means learning about more than just the disability that affects your loved one. Continue, continue to learn about ableism and stereotypes along with the history of disability rights and activism. Society will always try to break us down into categories that makes our advocacy much less powerful. But if we can recognize all the ways in which disability can impact a person's life out in the world, then we can take a stand we can stand strong as one community and be much more effective at change. Consider reading articles and books from writers with disabilities. Consider listening to disability-focused podcasts and interacting with people directly who have disabilities out in your community. Learn from them. What are the barriers in our community? What's missing? What do they wish that they had access to? You can recognize that many people with disabilities are also battling other isms due to intersectionality and take that into consideration too. We can challenge ableism as it happens. Check your vocabulary. Words matter. If you are unsure how to discuss a person's disability with them, simply ask them what words they use. Use person-first language when talking about individuals with disabilities. This puts the person first and it, and it acknowledges that they are more than just their disability. Don't talk to a person or a child who has a disability like they are younger than they are. Give people's, people with disabilities a platform to speak for themselves. Never assume that you know what someone needs due to them having a specific diagnosis. Instead, ask the person directly if they have a need and do what you can to offer any support that they request. Advocate for accessibility and inclusivity. Be that person who amplifies people with disabilities instead of speaking for them to help to promote true acceptance and inclusivity. And make sure to elect people who will enact policies or laws that counter ableism. Definitely seek out those organizations who assist people with disabilities and support them however you can. Ask them what the current issues are. Find out how you can get involved in advocating for that change. Be aware of policies and laws at your local level. Like Andrea was talking, the school board is a powerful group of people setting the stage for what happens in our schools. But also reach out at the state legislator, at the state legislative level. We can all make a positive impact and understand what is or potentially could be happening as a negative impact on people with disabilities. Reach out to those representatives. Make sure to shine a light on the laws that are helping to support people with disabilities. So these have been some great examples. Let's see if we can talk a little bit more about your examples and ideas for your advocacy journey, Andrea. Yeah, so we've given you a lot to think about today when it comes to ableism. Um, we still want to answer questions. So if there are questions, please, Stephanie, keep feeding them to us. But if anything has connected with you and you have an actionable step that you're planning on starting since you've gone through and listened to us talk, we welcome you to please share that in the questions tab as well, um, just to feed other people's ideas of activism and just to you know help spread that advocate advocacy for change, I guess. Um, 
Otherwise, as you're doing that, please type in what actionable plan you're gonna take. Stephanie, are there questions? Did they want us to dive in deeper on any of the content a little bit? Um, we've got a little bit of time left, so. We have a couple questions. We also have someone that shared that this is one of the best webinars they've been to, that it really impacted and resonated with them, that it's comforting to hear presenters talk so knowledgeably about this and that they appreciate the two of you. Um, Thank you. We have someone Thank that you. is asking if um, we're seeing ableism in school and in classrooms because teachers are lacking support. Do we think this is a cause and effect situation? Yeah, yeah I mean, go ahead, Andrea. Okay, I mean, yes, it depends on what the ableism looks like. There's, there is definitely staffing struggles, and I know that some, some staff are in over their heads. If you see that happening and you see them going down the road of not providing appropriate supports and things, sometimes as a parent, you have to step up and try to help them too and recognize that some things are out of their control. If you see it as a perception, conversations like I've had to have conversations with staff trained about the presumption of competence for my child. And that's an uncomfortable conversation to have, but sometimes it is about changing perspectives rather than changing the staffing. So it's about seeing where the problems are coming from and maybe it's an administrator that's causing the staff to have a harder time. It really depends on where that, where that cause is. Um, but they're, you know, reach out if reach out to your regional parent mentor and they can give you specific steps if there's a certain issue that you're having for sure that they can troubleshoot with you on when it comes to how staff are responding to your student or whatnot and troubleshooting where the problem lies. Is it within the person or is it within that system? Um, yeah, I definitely agree. We, we have a great handout that will give some uh, resources and some more information to help you with your advocacy journey. Um, but it's certainly about relationships, communication, helping to educate someone, helping them understand your child and how they work, and um, enabling your child to become a good self-advocate. We don't spend a lot of time with our kids at school. And so the more that they understand about their disability, the more that they understand about what does work for them, the more that they can combat some of that perception that maybe an accommodation is a bonus or an extra or a, a privilege that, that other kids don't get. And that perception of, well, why should I give you an advantage um, mm -hmm. is something that they can tackle as they become more capable to communicate that this is about my needs, my accommodation. It's what helps me access my learning. And we definitely have some great action plan items coming through in the chat. We have some folks that are reaching out to their PAC um, at their district and their ISD to get more involved. We have people that are going to be sharing our uh, the recording of the webinar on their Facebook profile and on their parent Facebook groups to spread the word. And they're going to speak directly with their um, anti-diversity, equity, and inclusion school board candidates. Uh, we have others that are going to be contacting their DEI directors and inquiring about representation of our DEI team for persons with disabilities, are their parents or are their students, and other inequities for access, such as sports. Uh, we also have a lot of appreciation here for you guys and the knowledge and information that you have shared today that they're um, definitely well received and we appreciate the time that you've spent with us sharing this information and really um, helping put it into perspective. So thank you ladies for joining us today. Uh, we do have a couple other like comments and questions that I'm gonna go ahead and address directly. Um, but I think this was uh, fantastic information that sounds like it was very, very needed and very well received. So thank you both for joining us. Can I add one thing, Stephanie, that this is the opportunity for all of us to to take ourselves from that I voice where I'm concerned about my world and what I'm seeing and turn it up a little bit into the we voice and start to address what we need as a, as a larger community, as potentially a society to help include people with disabilities. Yeah, and as Nicole stated, the, div the division is the big key. Like 
you know, they they try to divide us based on what the specific disability is. They try to divide us based on what our intersectionalities are of race and sex and that type of thing. We have to stop worrying about all those pieces and just come together no matter where we come from to support all. And that's why, you know, we have the benefit of talking to so many families that are so diverse with so many children that are so diverse across spectrums of income, of race, of disability, that we get some of those perspectives. But sometimes as a parent, you're isolated in your own world thinking that you're alone. And it's hard to recognize that there's a bigger community out there that you can connect with so that our voice can become more powerful. Thank you, ladies. Absolutely. Um, I am going to, uh, I have shared the one page handout and resources one more time. If you guys do want to open that, you will also get an email um, after the session that has that and has the survey information there. Um, this was live streamed on Facebook. It is going to be on Facebook. If you want to share that out, we encourage you to do so. It will also eventually um, make it in, onto our YouTube channel. Um, with a fully captioned version there. Um, please follow us on social media. Check out the information on the website. Do not hesitate to reach out to your regional parent mentor. Um, Nicole and Andrea are two of our fantastic regional parent mentors that are all across the state and are here to support you as you have questions. So please do not hesitate. We are so glad that you could take a little bit of time out of your day today to join us. Um, we hope the information was useful and I hope you have a great day. The Michigan Alliance for Families is an IDEA grant-funded initiative of the Michigan Department of Education, Office of Special Education, and Michigan's Federal Parent Training and Information Center, funded by the U.S. Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs, will close us out. Have a wonderful afternoon.